Good evening, this is Mervyn Hanley, Conversations with Mervyn Hanley. It is Sunday, December the 3rd, and in my company this evening, I'll be speaking to the leader of the People's Action Movement on Sinkets. He is also the current representative of the St. Christopher Five. I believe that's mainly Sandy Point, the Honorable Sean Richards. Tonight, I will speak to Mr. Richards on a number of issues. We have one hour here. Of course, I won't be able to get in everything in this one hour, but we'll try our best to get in as much questions as possible. So let me welcome for a second time on THG Network, Honorable Sean Richards. Welcome, sir, and I'm happy to have you. Thank you, Marvin. And it, indeed, it is my pleasure to once again speak to you on the THG Network, in particular, conversations with this Marvin. I have always said to persons that as an elected representative, I am a servant of the people. And as such, I always relish any opportunity to be able to give an account to the people in terms of representing them and my stewardship, whether as a member of parliament and when I served as a minister of government. Uh, it's been over a year uh I almost said Minister Richards. I'm so accustomed of that. But it's 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 been over a year, uh, Honorable Richards. Uh, you've been in opposition. Uh, what have you been up to? Um, some um, would have stated that, oh, he's a bit quiet. But tell us, what have you been up to? I have been up to quite a few things, Marvin. Being in opposition comes with its own set of challenges and also opportunities. In terms of opportunities, of course, it gives you the opportunity to be able to reflect on the time that you would have spent in government. What you did, if that would have impacted persons, what you did, if that would have landed you in opposition. And in terms of the party itself, in particular as the leader of the party, why is it that persons would not have given the People's Action Movement the majority of seats for the People's Action Movement to be back in government? Especially taking into consideration that during the coalition government, eh, that on both occasions, the People's Action Movement had a majority of the seats. Now, having said that, it means then eh, that as the only member of the People's Action Movement who is now an elected member of a parliament, that the party has some deep introspection to undertake. Therefore, the party has been doing uh, that particular introspection and determining the way forward for the People's Action Movement. Okay, we'll get to, to that. But let us get to the governance side of things. And I, I want to ask them very direct, not around the bush questions tonight on THG Network. So hopefully we're able to make some news tonight, depending on what you say to us. Now, Honorable Richards, there is a whole lot of ground I want to cover. But let's get right to one of the number one topics on Sinkets right now, the, the topic of crime. We have seen the country at what? Number what? Is it 28 or 29 for the year? And I, 28 to the best of my 28, okay. And I will read a press statement your party issued, then I will follow up with a question. And the statement reads as follows, as it relates to the, the latest the double murder on St. Kitts. Every life is important. On Wednesday, November 1st, approximately three weeks ago, Honorable Prime Minister Dr. Terence Drew was swift to inform the nation that the Minister of Tourism, Honorable Marsha Henderson, was hospitalized, having undergone emergency surgery the previous evening. He indicated that her health and well-being are important to all of us as a nation and implored us to keep her in our thoughts and prayers. The very same day, the nation recorded its 24th homicide as a young man, 24-year-old Liebert, succumbed to a stabbing wound. 
The Prime Minister and Minister of National Security, Honorable Terence Drew, has to date not found the loss of this life sufficiently important to utter a word to the nation or to ask for an I- one iota of prayer for the family and friends of the victim. Exactly one week ago, on Wednesday, November 15th, an 18-year-old Malik Hughes of Matt Knight was gunned down in the prime of his life on the Frigate Bay Road. Again, our Prime Minister and the Minister of National Security, Dr. Drew, has remained mute. Perhaps in the mind of Dr. Drew, this young man was of no importance to the nation or anyone. Five days ago, November 18th, a third murder for the month took place just outside of the constituency office of Dr. Drew and within his constituency when 23-year-old Wilbert D. Pemberton was gunned down in broad daylight. If one didn't know better, he or she would think that Dr. Drew is dumb as he has uttered not a single word of comfort, caution or dismay to the Federation. Today, exactly three weeks later since Dr. Drew announced that tourism minister Henderson is important to all of us, families mourn as a double murder takes place in the constituency of the Honorable Prime Minister, and again he remains mute. One can only surmise that the lives of these two young men are also of no importance to our Minister of National Security, their families and friends, or the nation. Is it that one has to be a Minister of Government for Dr. Drew to crave the nation's prayers, thoughts, and attention? Unfortunately, neither the two young men today nor the other three this month were a Minister of Government. Is it that the Honorable Prime Minister has no regard or empathy for the families and lives of our young men whose lifeless bodies lay in our streets? Did he solicit the vote of any of the individuals in his bid for office? And were they important then? It is blatantly apparent that Dr. Drew is clueless and does not care. Five young men were brutally murdered in three weeks, and there is no sense of care or alarm from Dr. Drew, our Minister of National Security. The security of our nation and its citizens should be the number one priority of any government. And indeed, Dr. Drew is the Minister of National Security. His complete lack of empathy and actions to date as the murders steadfastly increase, which now stands at 28 for the year, must not be condoned by the citizens of this federation. He met a peace program in place which, despite all criticisms, drastically reduced our homicides. He swiftly brought it to an end merely for political expediency, and now we are all reaping the effects as our young men are being constantly murdered. There have been five murders thus far for November, a total of 28 to date for the year, and 2023 is yet to climax. The People's Action Movement calls upon Dr. Drew to immediately resign and allow someone with compassion for all of our people, not just ministers of government, to take the reins of national security. We also extend our thoughts and prayers to the families and friends of all the victims. We urge our citizens to show compassion for each other and to put down the guns and put away violence. Every life is important. That was a very lengthy press release here from the People's Action Movement. But let me ask you, Honorable Richards, why do you think it was appropriate to include Minister Marsha Henderson in this press release? Before I answer your specific question, Marvin, Mm -hmm. let me, on behalf of the People's Action Movement, extend condolences to all of the murder victims thus far for the year in particular to their families, to their friends. No murder can be easy for those who are left to mourn, especially when you take into consideration the fact that these are young men. Their parents do not expect to have to bury their children. Just yesterday, for example, I had the opportunity to visit a family in Sandy Point. And that particular family is going through the grieving process as their son died. This wasn't true a homicide, but because of other particular issues. And the father said to me that, you know, as a parent, I did not expect to have to bury a child. And this is the second child that that father is burying. Again, none of the two children succumbed to death because of gang violence. However, one understands that as a parent, you want to see your children live. You want to see your children mature to a particular age. And you expect that when you 
die, your children are here to live, to keep your legacy alive. So again, I extend condolences to all of the families and friends on behalf of myself, on behalf of the People's Action Movement, and the, on behalf of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, who have been left to mourn. Five murders in the month of November. Indeed, Dr. Joe came on air the morning after Minister Henderson had undergone emergency surgery and he asked the persons to keep her in their prayers, in their thoughts, and he said she is important to the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. I know Minister Henderson, and likewise, I wish her well, I wish her a speedy recovery. Because, as the statement says, I also agree with that all lives are important. She happens at this particular point in time to be our Minister of Tourism. Tourism is an important aspect of our development. And though our politics may not be the same, one would want her to be able to perform in such a manner is that the majority of persons in St. Kitts and Nevis are able to benefit from the tourism sector and any policies or initiatives undertaken by the Minister and Ministry of Tourism. However, while she serves as a Minister of Government and likewise, I serve as a Member of Parliament, I've served as a Minister of Government all of us have an important contribution to make in terms of the development of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. No single individual can do it alone. No single political party can do it alone. It takes that combination of effort by all of us to develop the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. We are all important. Someone might be involved in criminal activity today, might be involved in a gang, but it doesn't mean that that person doesn't have potential. Some of us, for different reasons, we may sort of lose our way in life, but how do we get those persons to come back on the correct path and to make a significant contribution to the development of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Each life is important. I have seen persons, for example, who were part of the peace program, the alternative lifestyle pathway program, who are now employers. They've been able to now employ persons. They've been able to develop businesses. They have been able to turn around their lives. And so it is to give a persons an opportunity. Therefore, when the Prime Minister says to persons is that keep Minister Henderson in your prayers, Minister Henderson is important. We understand it. And we empathize with Minister Henderson. But likewise, when you have young men falling victims to homicide, the Prime Minister likewise should come to the nation and say to the nation that look, these are young persons, young men in particular, who have potential. How do we have their potential? They are important to the development of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. I can go further. Some of them have children. Those children are now left to mourn and to go up without that father figure in their lives. Numerous research would show that the father figure is important. It's not just about a single mother raising a child. It is about getting that full support of the family. Some of them, if they're able to turn their lives into a different direction, they can possibly be the next Prime Minister of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis the next tourism minister of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. That is why the People's Action Movement stated that 
every life is important. One of these young men could possibly be the next prime minister of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, the next minister of tourism of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, if given the opportunity to do so. But let me ask you this, Honorable Richards. It was during your time part of the Team Unity Coalition. The administration spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on the peace program. And yes, to the administration's credit, the numbers were down significantly. But realistically, though, um, Honorable, was this really sustainable? I mean, are we seeing the fruits of that now that now that the peace program has been, well... Um, dismantled somewhat. The guys have become trigger happy once more. This was a budget of 40 plus million dollars. Do you think that this was sustainable? And is, I mean, eventually, if you were still in government, wouldn't it be a situation where, okay, you recognize that this cannot go on and the same thing would probably happen under a new administration if re-elected? I don't agree with that, Marvin. Okay. The reasons why I don't agree with that are as follows. One, the peace program began in 2019. The statistics would show that when the peace program was initiated, the number of homicides decreased significantly. No one can dispute that. That is a fact. Secondly, research shows that these particular programs must be given at least a five-year span before one should really make an assessment as to the impact of the program and make a determination as to whether or not the program has been meeting the particular objectives and if you want to continue with it. Unfortunately, if that hasn't been the case with the peace program, the now government criticized the peace program, said that millions of dollars were being spent on this particular program, and it is a waste of money. Now, how do you basically quantify a peace program loss of life in terms of a waste of money? What price do you put on the life of an individual? People go to insurance companies and insure their lives for millions of dollars. So, to say millions of dollars were being spent on the peace program would also mean breaking down how the money that was expended was allocated in terms of the program itself. The program had different components to it. You had training to it. Okay, what were the training programs? Did any did the recipients benefit from the training program? And the training program again also entailed different things. The soft skills. How do you speak to persons if you have an interview? What do you say during an interview? The training in terms of helping them to develop certain vocational skills. The training in terms of those who have an interest in a business and developing certain managerial, certain leadership skills, etc. You mentioned training, but how do you explain, though, during the time the peace program was on, there have been times when you see some of the young men, they're just splurging their monies on video and counting thousands of dollars and stuff like that. And there you have a six farmer or somebody who just graduated from CFBC. They can't find a job. But here you have some of these young men who were just, it, it was almost like in your face squandering. And yes, we have it made every week. We get our bundles of cash and that was it. And then a young person home cannot find a job, cannot get these kind of uh, monies that they were getting. Marvin, I would be the first to say to you that there is no program that is perhaps perfect. And it is when these things come to the fore that you have to take a look and to see some of the changes that you need to make. Especially when you see these particular videos, one then is able to assess, okay, who is in, who is the individual in the video? Did this particular individual actually accumulate this kind of cash 
those things. You just can look at the vi- at the video and make mm-hmm. that particular determination. Yeah, but sometimes that's what they say. They they would say stuff like, "Our oh, pay for this week" and and stuff like that. Not everyone, mind you, of course. You'll have bad eggs, so probably these were the bad eggs. But it did not look good to know, and it doesn't sound. Go ahead, go ahead. Because it doesn't necessarily mean is that while some of them are making this particular claim, that in, indeed this is where they have been able to accumulate that amount of cash from. Mm-hmm. But if you see the videos, then you begin to do the necessary investigation right. and determine, okay, well, this particular individual is claiming that I've earned this amount of money from the peace program. Is the individual working? How much is the individual being paid for the work that is being done? Is this is there some particular loophole within the program so this person is being paid for work uh, that the individual has not done? These are some of the hard questions that you must ask because even when you look within the private sector, even when you look within government, you have persons who may claim I have this particular contract, I have this particular job. This is how much I've made from it. And so you begin to look at value for money. Are you getting value for money? And so, as you said, you may have some bad eggs in the program. But even if you have bad eggs in the program, you have to do an assessment of the program in totality and determine whether or not the benefits of the program outweigh the bad. And if you make that particular determination that generally the benefits are good, you look to see the improvements that you need to make. Your party has called on Prime Minister Drew to resign from his national security portfolio. Is your party then saying while he has failed as national security minister, he's doing well in his other portfolios, Minister Richard? That certainly isn't what the party is saying. Because if one is to take an honest assessment, an objective assessment of his performance in terms of the other ministries, one would ask for his resignation from the other ministries. For example, he's a minister of finance. Mm -hmm. Financially, the country is employed well. You speak to a majority of persons in this country, they would say to you that economically, things are very difficult in the Federation of Things and Needs. Dr. Joe himself, from certain statements that he has made, has admitted it. If you can buy Kellogg's, buy Sunshine. (laughs) If you can buy this particular brand of milk, buy this other brand of milk. So you get that in terms of the general economic conditions within the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. When we look at the Reset 40 for Independence and the $1,000 which had been distributed to persons, Mm -hmm. I have never ever in my life seen so many persons lining up at ATM machines all hours of the night to access the $1,000 which was paid. Maybe people feel that the money would have been taken back from them. But you ask the vast majority of those persons, has that money been saved? No. It went into paying bills. Of course, the young persons out there are unemployed. So economically, things are not well in the country. There was an admission recently that in terms of revenues coming in from the CBI program, those revenues have decreased. And before you continue, I was just about to ask about the CBI uh, program, the citizenship by... Yes. Let me finish. Okay. Sure. Because he's also the Minister of Health. What is happening within our healthcare sector? Very serious concerns are being expressed by persons. So many persons know what to JNF and do not make it out of JNF. God forbid I have to go there at any point in time. I would be very concerned. Don't get me wrong. I've seen some persons who have said they have been there. The service has been very good. But you also have a significant number of persons questioning the quality of service that you receive at JNF. You get the press releases every now and again to indicate, well, this new service is available. This new machine is available. But what you don't get from the Ministry of Health is that the number of casualties at JNF, the number of persons who have been admitted and are able to return from 
JNF and continue to live a healthy life. That is an important statistic. Hmm. It seems as though far too many persons are going to JNF and don't make it out. You have the complaints from persons about the quality of service. She is the Minister of Health. So again, one cannot say that in terms of being Minister of Health, is that he is performing optimally. He's the Minister of National Security, Minister of Health, a Minister of Finance. He has responsibility for the CBI program. And when you look at all of these, one cannot give him a passing grade. Okay, so now we can move on to the CBI. There has been a lot of tit for tat as of late, but first let me ask you, and just to clarify, on the campaign tree last year, you said that you were demanding to know how much was in the CBI. My question to you, though, and, and you just mentioned that it has drastically reduced, so I'm assuming then that you have an idea. But then again, if you were a part of a coalition... How could you not know the numbers over the period between 2015 and early 22? I was part of the collision between 2015 and 2022. And as persons are aware, I took a decision and the People's Action Movement took a decision eh, that the collision is no longer feasible. It is not serving the best interests of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. My cabinet colleagues would verify the fact that I said it to them and I said during cabinet mm-hmm. that I am not comfortable making certain decisions and not knowing the status of the CBI program, what are we getting in in terms of revenues from the CBI program. If that is a fact, is that anyone can verify who would have served as a member of the team unity government. So I'm not going to hide that. Things were not perfect. And it is because things were not perfect why the Team Unity Coalition ended up having an early election in the year 2022. Okay, Honorable Richards, there's been so much talk this year about double salary. When you were a part of Team Unity government, double salaries were given every year except, I believe, for one year. And that was because of the COVID pandemic. Now, I want you to listen. Let us look at this clip or watch it of the leader of the opposition and Premier of Nevis, Honorable Mark Brantley. I will play it in its entirety, then I will be back on the other side with a question. Let's look at this. My own view on this double salary story is that it is a bad idea. It is unsustainable, and I believe what we should focus is to do what we have done in Nevis, to give our workers a salary increase, 15%. Uh, They will get the final tranche, 5% on the 1st of January, 2024. And uh, so that people could have a, a livable wage, I, that language has been used, people will have a decent wage. Um, this notion of every Christmas government taking up millions of dollars in the context of Nevis is about 10 million. So sink it has to be at least two and a half times that. So you're talking about 30 to 35 million dollars uh, every Christmas. For what? And I honestly say for what? Because a lot of people getting that money are not producing and if you know if it causes some upset then i apologize for that upset but it's a fact and so we if we're going to compensate people we should base it on their performance are they coming to work on time are they are they there are they committed to the task at hand they putting in that extra effort when necessary but them who come late take tours for lunch leave early always sick always home always got problems always out of the office walk in the street down in the bar them in tongue drinking rum and come christmas them hold a double salary just so and then the caller made the point and i think it's a fair point what happens to those people out there in the private sector they're not getting any double salary if you happen to work at rams or tdc or hosfords you're not getting a double salary so why is a public servant being given a privilege with taxpayers money that you don't get and so I think there's some merit to say that if there is something to be done, then it has to be a more across the board. It has to benefit more people. And it can't be that public servants just sit down and say, oh, Christmas has come, and I know I'm going to get this extra money. right? When others out there who are working equally as hard to build a country aren't guaranteed anything at all. 
because they happen to be in the private sector. A lot of people now are applying to government. Some people have three and four jobs in the private sector. They say they don't want them. They want to be in government. What do you think it is? What do you think it is? That everybody rushing into government. You could imagine in one house, for example, where you got five or six people in that house working for government, that all of them collect a double salary come Christmas. That is what people are now looking at. And I am saying the double salary used to be something as an incentive when the country does very well. There's something to celebrate, like a 40 years of independence, something. But now it's like people are thinking, you know. I see people putting up things now, say we're on the hurricane watch, now we're on a double salary watch. That's what people are thinking about. It's like a joke. And people are now expecting it. So it's no longer even a reward for, for any good performance. It's, it's just, I think that it's unfortunate. And we're developing a kind of culture here and a kind of society. You're going to come back and bite us. Honorable Richards, do you think that the double salary is a bad idea? You just heard the Premier in his comments. Your thoughts? Let me begin by saying this. The double salary has never been based on performance. When you look at the history of double salaries in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, you perhaps would go back to the 1980s. At no point in time, any government said to the people of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis that the real criteria, the genuine criteria for giving your double salary is based on your performance. So one really cannot look at performance in terms of the payment of a double salary. Had that been the case, then perhaps some would have received it, some would not have received it. And we have to be honest about that, okay? I understand what the Honorable Premier is saying, is that if you're going to give a bonus payment to persons, and I work within the private sector, so I know that when bonus payments were made within the private sector, the percentage normally would depend on a performance evaluation. That hasn't been the case within the government in terms of doing a performance evaluation and paying persons a double salary. The double salaries are paid for various other reasons. Political expediency and election is coming up and a double salary is being paid to get support. A double salary is being paid because it is recognized that economically you need that stimulant within the economy. It's carnival time, it's Christmas time, you want persons to spend and you expect that when persons spend that the business places which have benefited they would spend likewise and so the government is going to benefit in terms of taxes. You want to create a feel-good atmosphere you want persons to support the carnival. The government has done well in terms of revenue collection. And so you make a determination that since we have done well, we have a good surplus this particular year. Let us give those who work for government a double salary. It has never, ever really been based on performance. If you want to base it on performance, then it's going to take a conversation with the government workers long in advance of the payment of any sort of double salary or bonus to them. Persons must understand is that okay, come whether it is December, November, whichever month, you might receive whether it is a double salary, whether it is a percentage of your salary, but it's going to be based on your performance. You must also put some sort of criteria in place in terms of how you're going to determine the performance of persons. If those things have not been done. So to say to persons now eh, that you have persons who are slacking, you have persons who are not performing, they don't deserve a double salary. It doesn't go with the tradition of the expectation that persons have become accustomed to. If we're going to change that, like I said, it is going to mandate that you orient the thinking of persons differently. Even as serving as a minister of government. I have had my own questions, I have had my own issues. You speak to, for example, the principal of a school, and the principal is saying to you, this particular teacher hasn't been performing. I have so many issues with this particular teacher. Two, three weeks later, you get a recommendation from an 
encourage Prime Minister Drew to give a double salary to civil servants this year, 2020. I would encourage him to give a double salary because things are hard in the country. Okay. Economically, people are suffering, and as I said, the double salary has not been based on performance. It has been to stimulate the economy. The economy right now is flat. You don't have any major capital projects to date under this current administration. And as the Minister of Finance, Dr. Joyce said the country is doing very well. When people look at the fact that COP28 is taking place, a delegation of 20 from the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis has been able to attend COP28. But you don't get the impression that the government has any financial issues. And it's not just COP28. Every week, ministers of government all over the globe. When you look at Antigua and Barbuda, I think it's what, seven persons? Also attending COP28. You look at Dominique. Where is COP28? Um, that, is that in Dubai? It's in Dubai. Okay. When you look at Dominica, the Prime Minister there is attending. You don't have 20 persons attending COP28. So you said, well, okay. Think it's a need. This has to be doing very well to be able to send 20 persons. So one doesn't get the impression that economically things are bad in the country so that you can't afford to pay this double salary. Just in September, three months ago, you said everyone who has contributed for however many weeks to Social Security are giving you $1,000. In June, are giving you $500 as a CBI dividend. Hmm. Why would civil servants get the impression that the government can't afford to give them a double salary? They are not accustomed to get it based on any particular performance measure. They are accustomed to get it because politically, I think it's the expedient thing to do. I want to stimulate the economy, so I think it is the best thing to do. People out there criticizing me, saying performance, so I think it is the best thing to do. <laughs> You're laughing, but it is the truth. I, I know, I know, I know. And even more so under this government, it seems as any time people start to get nice, give them some money, see if I could get them to shut up. And I don't know what point in time there's going to be that realization. You give them the money, but things are so bad because after they get the money, they spend the money and still nothing is happening to stimulate the economy. No capital projects are happening. It is an unfortunate situation, but I cannot honestly say that I am against giving persons a double salary until you realistically take a look as to why do you pay a double salary? What criteria do I put in place for a double salary? And persons have that understanding, that very clear understanding, then it becomes a different conversation. 
Let me ask you, we're winding down, but I I have to get in some politics. We've spoken a lot about crime, national security. We've spoken about the CBI, the economy. So let's get into some politics for a few minutes before we close off this interview. You mentioned in the in your opening statement that, of course, the People's Action Movement would have been doing some introspection and all of that, uh, what you did right and what you did wrong. Minister Richards, let me ask you this, and a number of folks have asked this question. You guys had three more years in office. Three, up until 2025. When you look back at this, what do you say at nights when you go to bed and you unwind and you go back down memory lane and you just meditate? You had three more years in office. Some will say that you messed it up. What do you say? Honestly, to the persons, I'm at peace. And you said, what do you say when you go to bed? When you go to bed, you need to be comfortable, you need to be able to sleep, you need to be able to get a good night rest. And if you're not at peace with yourself, I don't think that you would be able to do those things. I have heard all sorts of different stories out there Is that Sean Richards was influenced by this, Sean Richards messed up, Pam messed up, etc. I would say to persons that a particular decision was made based on circumstances and until you're in a particular situation, you really don't understand the gravity of it. And let me dispel something since you've asked that question. Because I've heard it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Is that the Mark Grantly influenced Sean Richards to bring an end to team unity? I'm going to say this and I'm going to say it publicly. In 2020, Sean Richards was offered the Prime Ministership of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Sean Richards took a decision that that is not the agreement that we have had in place. Who offered you the Prime Ministership of St. Kitts and Nevis? I was offered the Prime Ministership of St. Kitts and Nevis by persons both within CCM and persons within PAM. Okay. Then I said to persons, okay, Matt Bantley couldn't convince me to become the Prime Minister then. Persons within PAM could not convince me to become the Prime Minister then. But in 2022, I suppose is that for political purposes, is this is what they want to put within the minds of persons that Sean Richards has been influenced and Sean Richards mashed up team unity because of that. Lindsey Grant can say to you, and Mark Grantley can say to you or to anyone else for that matter, that Sean Richards was the one who began that conversation that, look, things are not going right and some changes are to be made. And really and truly for me, it wasn't about prime ministership. It was about doing changes for her things so, so that the vast majority of persons can benefit. Not just the people from constituency number seven. Not just persons supporting PLP benefiting. I have constituents. There are the persons within them, they have constituents. Those from Nevis, they are likewise. They have constituents. Mm -hmm. And it can be about any one particular individual or one, any, about any one particular political party. It is a coalition. And ultimately, it must be about the entire federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. It must be about the coalition partners and each individual feeling equal within the partnership. Not one person having information and the rest of the team has no idea as to what is going on. Not one person determining who should benefit from who should not benefit. Who should get this and who should not get that. And so we tried our best to resolve the issues, but we recognize that while we were willing to do so, other persons were not willing to do so. And so the collision came to an end. One may ask if in retrospect, in 2020, should you have taken the Prime Ministership? But knowing what I know now, yes, I would have done it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would have done it knowing what I know now. But you give persons the benefit of the doubt. You had been out campaigning. You said to the electorate that look, the intention is for this person to serve as Prime Minister. And then how do you go back the very next day after the election and you say something totally different to the electorate? 
And that is a question that I had to ask myself. Okay? You make a certain commitment to persons and then the very next day, you fall back on that particular commitment. However, as I said, if in terms of yourself and some information that you had then, mm-hmm. I perhaps would have made a different decision. But as I said, I'm at peace. Okay. Have you had any conversations with former Prime Minister Harris since the election of 2022? No, I have not. Okay. And uh, what do you say to folks who say that once there are two and three parties in opposition, that the People's Action Movement doesn't stand a chance, and so you need a unity coalition in order to win any future elections on St. Kitts or St. Kitts and Nevis? I am not going to dismiss it. Because when you have three political parties, you're looking at a further split in terms of the votes. Mm -hmm. And while persons may look at it in terms of just the two current parties which are in opposition, it can be a split, not just amongst those. It can be a split amongst all three of the political parties here in the same case. Okay? And it was played out during the last election. And in particular, in the last election, I would go so far as to say eh, that the collision fell apart and the supporters lost confidence in terms of the two parties which had been part of the collision and the Labour Party benefited from it. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't mean that going forward that the Labour Party will still continue to benefit from that because the persons out there who are now fed up with the Labour Party and it is only left to be seen how those persons would vote in a next general election. I have seen within the Caribbean and persons who it was felt could not have won a seat because traditionally this is how persons vote in a particular constituency and it didn't pan out that way at the end of the day. I listened to the last general elections in Antigua and Boston felt, for example, that Asad Michael as an independent could not win mm-hmm. because traditionally this is how Boston in that particular constituency vote. History was made. Asad Michael won. When the former Prime Minister right here in St. Kitts and Nevis decided he's finished with the Labour Party, now has his own party, the Boston felt that it's a Labour seat. And so he could not win. That in a pan out. Let me take West Barsley, for example, a constituency that always supported the Labour Party and had Akila by her name, who won that seat in 2020. And so she defied the odds, she defied the statistics. So for me, when people determine they want a change, people will make a change. That is absolutely true. That is true. When I won the Sandy Point seat in the year 2004, for the very first time, in the prior election, the Labour Party had won that seat in 2000, giving the Labour Party all eight seats. And I determined I wasn't entering an election to lose. And so while the Labour Party had won it in 2000, something not expected, something which never happened, it happened. But when people want, determine they want a change, people will vote for a change. And let me ask you my final question. Are we going to see Sean Richards run another election again? Would you continue to be the, the leader of the People's Action Movement? You made me laugh. If that is something if that is still under consideration for Sean Richards. When I entered politics in 2004, I said it is not going to be a career for Sean Richards. And let me state here that if Sean Richards makes a decision that he is not going to be the leader of the People's Action Movement after the next convention of the People's Action Movement, I can leave politics and be proud of my legacy, be proud of my record in terms of politics, in terms of the leadership of the People's Action Movement. Sean Richards entered politics in 2004 at the age of 31. I was elected as a representative for Sandy Point. If you perhaps look at the record of persons elected on the IPAM ticket, Sean Richards was perhaps the youngest person ever to be elected on a IPAM ticket. Sean Richards has contested five elections, won five elections. The only other person in Pam would have won all the elections contested would be Dame Constance Mitchell. But she contested three. Sean has done five, 
as one all fight. Mr. Ann Richards has served as Deputy Prime Minister of the country. Yes, I didn't make it to Prime Minister. I would have served as Deputy Prime Minister, would have acted as Prime Minister on numerous occasions. Sean Richards came into politics at a time when the Labour Party held all of the seats in St. Kitts, broke that monopoly, and has ensured up until this day that that monopoly hasn't continued because even though Labour is now in government, Labour still doesn't have a monopoly in terms of all of the seats in St. Kitts. When I came into politics, Palmer got a voice in Parliament, and up until this day, I'm still as a voice in Parliament. When I was elected leader of the People's Action Movement, I made a commitment then that Pam would get into government. I became the leader in 2012, by 20, late 2012, I think it could have been December or October, November, sometime they were both, but in the last quarter of 2012. By 2015, the People's Action Movement was in government with a majority of the seats in government. So Marvin, if I make a decision tomorrow not to continue as the leader of the People's Action Movement, I have a record that I'm proud of, a record that I can stand on. I have to give up my U.S. citizenship. Significant sacrifice mm -hmm. to serve the people of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. But I did so. Country above self. I did so. When is the convention? The convention is normally in March, April of each year. Last year it was later because of certain other events which were conflicting with the date. We haven't determined a date as yet for next year. Uh, but certainly when a decision is made as to whether or not I am going to relinquish that particular position, I will indicate to the public that I no longer have an interest. My thing is, is that you have other persons out there who may wish to serve, other persons out there who may wish to take the party to a different level that Sean Richards cannot take it to at this particular point in time. And if there are persons out there who can do that, because ultimately the objective of any political party is to be in government. And so if someone can do a better job than Sean Richards in terms of taking the People's Action Movement back into government, I have no issue with that. I am a PAM. I'm a supporter of the People's Action Movement. I will continue to support the People's Action Movement. So even if I take a particular decision, Sean Richards is still a supporter of PAM and Sean Richards will still be there to give advice to whoever. So ultimately, it's a decision that I will make. It's not that anyone within the People's Action Movement is forcing out Sean Richards, but in politics, just like anything else, you need new blood, you need new ideas, you need to ensure is that your place, whether it is the organization or whatever it is, in the best position to be able to be successful. Companies innovate every day. Change perhaps is the only constant within this world. And so if I take a decision to step aside, I will take all of the information before me, all of the pertinent factors before me into consideration and make a decision. Not in the best interest necessarily of Sean Richards, but in the best interest of the People's Action Movement, in the best interest of the Federation of Thinkers and Nevis. Well, listening to you, Honorable Richards, it sounds like 90% a decision has been made already. It's just a matter of making it official, well, from listening to you. But I understand fully what you're saying. I don't agree with you, Marvin. <laughs> okay. I don't agree with you. Okay. You know, you, you, you don't have to. I speak to persons every day. Mm -hmm. Just so like, for example, the persons were saying to me, boy, you look... You need to do this. These are the things that you need to do. Um, I get messages from persons. Some of them go so fast as quote scripture. Do not be discouraged. To be encouraged. It's a choice, a choice, a choice. Mm -hmm. And I believe in God. And God will guide, will ultimately guide my decision. Of course, of course. Things change every day, you know. This is politics too. Exactly. So it's not a made of decision 90%. So <laughs> <laughs> you took away with that particular view. 
<laughs> I like I like when you I like when you come back and you 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 make things very clear and direct. <laughs> and I'm making that very clear. Okay. <laughs> so it's not that I mean I've made a decision, and it's not that I'm ninety percent in terms of a decision because I, as I said, I will do what is in the best interest of the people's action movement. So, folks, that was just me. My interpretation, of course, the Honorable Sean Richards, that has been out the door. He, you know, he just took a shutdown at that. So that's not what's going to happen. He has not made a decision. Mind you, he has not made a decision. And we'll find out in a couple of months. It's just right around the corner. I'm the most winning candidate and the longest serving member of parliament that the People's Action Movement has produced to date. Wow. Pretty impressive. Okay. And I uh, have been serving the people of my constituency since 2004. And yes, I'm now in opposition, but I've pledged to them to give them the best possible service. And that I will continue to do. And if it is that the desire of the People's Action Movement is for Sean Richards to continue to be the political leader, I'm not going to abandon the party just like that. Right. And even if tomorrow a decision was to be made that Sean Richards is no longer the political leader of the People's Action Movement. It also doesn't mean that Sean Richards will not contest the next general election, okay? Mm. So, let us get that straight. <laughs> Thank you very much, Honorable Richards. Um, you've, you've been great today on, uh, on Conversations with Mervyn Hanley, and I appreciate you being here. And I want to be the first to, well, you have your birthday in a couple of days, so I'm, I'm wishing you a happy birthday in advance. And of course, happy holidays to you and your family. Marvin, thank you very much. And likewise, I'm aware that your birthday is just a day before my birthday. True. <laughs> and so I take the opportunity to also wish you the very best for your birthday, mm -hmm. to wish CHG Network ultimate success while it is that you might be just developing certain things in terms of teaching network in particular this program mm -hmm. i do believe that you are onto something you are providing an essential service you're asking the hard questions and unfortunately so many journalists especially here in think it's a nevis do not ask the hard questions they're free to do so mm -hmm. they're free to bend you're doing so. I said to you, keep it up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Honorable Richards, and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just been speaking to the leader of the People's Action Movement of uh, Think It's the Honorable Sean Richards. Stick and stay. Keep logged on to THG Network. Don't forget, tomorrow morning, we'll be right back here at 6 o'clock with THG News Today. Have a good night, everyone. I am Mervyn Hanley. <laughs> Thank you.